Friday, January 13th, rain-soaked California to see even more stormy weather over the weekend and on into next week. State and federal officials are pleading with residents to stay alert to possibly more flooding and damage. Rescuers trying to find survivors in the aftermath of a deadly storm system that barreled across parts of Georgia and Alabama, killing at least nine people and inflicting heavy damage. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen officially tells Congress that the U.S. is projected to reach its debt limit next week and will then resort to extraordinary measures to avoid default. It sets up a possible fight with right-wing Republicans in the House of Representatives over increasing the debt ceiling that could end up shutting down the government. The troubles keep piling up for serial liar George Santos, The New York State congressman whose alleged misuse of campaign funds now has another government accountability group asking the Federal Election Commission to investigate. A federal judge rules today that a magazine columnist can proceed with lawsuits alleging she was raped by former President Donald Trump in her department store a quarter century ago and Russian troops waging a ferocious fight for control of strongholds in Eastern Europe as a battle is reportedly raging in the top echelons of military power in Moscow over who should be running the invasion of Ukraine. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. With rain-soaked California expected to see more stormy weather over the weekend and into next week, California Governor Gavin Newsom and other state and federal officials pleaded with residents today to stay alert to possibly more flooding and damage. A series of storms that swallowed the state since late December has left at least 19 people dead. Today, 6,000 people were under evacuation orders, another 20,000 households without power. Homes have flooded, levees breached and topped, and mudslides and hurricane-force winds have slammed parts of the state, including a tornado touchdown in Northern California. The ongoing atmospheric river pattern brought showers to Northern California early today and additional surges of moisture, which will be even stronger, are expected to again spread rain and snow over the state in the coming days. Max Pringle reports. The National Weather Service said more than an inch of rain could fall in Northern California each day over the next few days and bring three to five inches of snow in the Sierra foothills. The Weather Service said the state has seen about nine inches of rainfall in the last 18 days. The storms have been linked to 19 deaths in the state so far. Some locations have seen their average annual rainfall already occur in just the last 18 days. David Lawrence is with the National Weather Service Sacramento region. He says Saturday's storm will bring some heavy precipitation. That will bring widespread heavy rainfall in some locations, very heavy mountain snowfall as well in addition to gusty winds up to 50 to 60 miles per hour. Uh, Not only could that rain produce additional flooding, and certainly we'll see some major impacts to travel in the mountains, but those winds could also blow over trees and bring additional power outages. Lawrence said a couple of more storm systems are expected early next week, and finally some drying out by the end of the week. Officials say they'll be watching for potential flooding in areas like the Sacramento Valley, southwestern Shasta County, Calusa County, and the northern San Joaquin Valley. Forecasters say that the Salinas River in Monterey County could rise above flood level. Nancy Ward is head of the California Office of Emergency Services. The state continues to take rapid action to pre-position our resources and focus on those areas that we know in the next two to three storm systems over the next three to four days 
will be critical. Forecasters say the overflow of the Salinas River will likely not flood areas of Highway 1 and 68 as earlier expected. That could have cut off the Monterey Peninsula. Governor Gavin Newsom was in Montecito today near Santa Barbara, surveying flood damage and observing storm preparation efforts. Newsom requested a federal emergency declaration for the state to expedite storm relief and preparation efforts. He said the Biden administration immediately sent FEMA out to size up the state's needs. FEMA director is in the state of California today assessing damage. Uh, was at our meeting, what we refer to as the SOC, today's State Operations Center, the UCG meeting this morning. She's out uh, on the road assessing damage as well, which is a good sign, and we're grateful for that. We could not ask for more from our federal partners. The White House has approved federal emergency declarations for 41 California counties. FEMA Director Deanne Criswell said the federal response has been widespread across California. We currently have over 300 staff on the ground. That includes both uh, members of FEMA as well as some of our other federal agencies that are supporting the ongoing response efforts. California has been hit with eight atmospheric river-fueled events since Christmas. Officials warn people to heed evacuation orders and motorists to avoid any standing water. About half the estimated 19 deaths in the state are related to cars stuck in floodwaters. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. The Internal Revenue Service has extended the tax filing deadline for the 41 counties in California declared disaster areas because of the storms. The extension is a month long to May 15th. The extension will include all Bay Area counties, plus Fresno, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Joaquin counties. The storms have put a dent in the state's drought, eliminating the threat of extreme drought in the state. That's according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. 35% of the state was in extreme drought two weeks ago. Most of the state now is in the severe or moderate categories of drought. Experts say it will take much more rain and snow to reverse the full effects of years of drought in California. The drought monitor characterizes the improvement as a significant reduction in drought intensity, but cautions that large parts of the state will still have what's called a moisture deficit. Rescuers are trying to find survivors in the aftermath of a deadly storm system that barreled across parts of Georgia and Alabama. The system killed at least nine people and inflicted heavy damage on Selma, a flashpoint of the civil rights movement. A better picture of the damage was expected to emerge later today. At least 35 possible tornado touchdowns were reported across several states, and suspected tornado damage was reported in at least 14 counties in Alabama and five in Georgia. Donna Warder reports. A twister damaged buildings and tossed cars in the streets of historic downtown Selma, Alabama. Mayor James Perkins said late Thursday the damage is still being assessed. We were blessed. Uh, we dodged some major bullets today. We really did. We, we, this could have been much worse. There were six confirmed deaths in Autauga County, Alabama, 41 miles northeast of Selma, where the county's emergency management director says more than three dozen homes were damaged or destroyed destroyed by a tornado that cut a 20-mile path across two communities. One person died in Georgia when a tree fell on a vehicle. I'm Donna Water. A new study says ExxonMobil knew its impacts on global warming as far back as the 1970s, but denied it in public statements for decades. The study in the journal Science looked at research that Exxon funded. The report says the oil giant scientists were remarkably accurate in their predictions about global warming. The research forecasts the coming warming with precision equal to or better than government and academic scientists. Its private forecast came during the same time that the oil giant publicly doubted that warming was real and dismissed climate models' accuracy. Exxon says its understanding of climate change evolved over the years and that critics are misunderstanding its earlier research.
President Joe Biden will deliver his second State of the Union address on February 7th, after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy extended the invitation for him to address a joint session of Congress on that day. It will be Biden's first address to a divided Congress after Republicans took control of the House of Representatives this month. It will come as his administration seeks areas of common interest with the newly empowered GOP, while also working to avoid a potentially debilitating default if the two parties can't come together to raise the federal debt limit in the coming months. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. There's been a bipartisan cooperation when it comes to uh, lifting the debt ceiling, and that's how it should be. That's how it should continue. It's not, and it's not, and should not be a political football. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has just notified Congress that the U.S. is projected to reach its dem- debt limit next Thursday, and will then be resorting to extraordinary measures to avoid default. Those measures include delaying some payments in order to provide some headroom to make other payments that are deemed more essential, like those for Social Security and debt instruments. Treasury Secretary Yellen said today that while her department cannot estimate how long the extraordinary measures will allow the U.S. to continue to pay its bills, It is unlikely that cash and extraordinary measures, she said, will be exhausted before early June. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida held wide-ranging talks at the White House today as Japan looks to build security cooperation with allies in a time of increased Chinese and North Korean military actions. The two administrations also sealed an agreement to bolster U.S.-Japanese cooperation on space with a signing ceremony by Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Japanese Foreign Affairs Minister Hayashi Yoshimasa. The Oval Office meeting and the signing ceremony at NASA's Washington headquarters kept a week-long tour for Kishida that took him to five European and North American capitals for talks on his effort to beef up Japan's security. Simon Marks reports. President Biden has welcomed Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to the White House to celebrate a growing defense partnership between Washington and Tokyo. These shared democratic values are the source of our strength, source of our alliance, and the source of our uh, being able to deliver for all our people. The 12th Artillery, currently stationed at Okinawa, are to be turned into a permanent U.S. military presence there and provided with what the Pentagon describes as more agile and lethal weaponry in a bid to offer fresh resistance to China's expansionism. They've also agreed to deepen cooperation in space. Simon Marks reporting. Donald Trump's company has been fined $1.6 million as punishment for a scheme in which some of his executives dodged personal income taxes on lavish job perks. The fine imposed today is the only penalty a judge could impose on the Trump organization. The company was convicted of 17 tax crimes, including conspiracy and falsifying business records. Reporter William Denislow has more. They were slapped with the maximum punishment available by uh, the judge at New York's State Supreme Court, which is a $1.6 million fine. We've heard from Manhattan's District Attorney Malvin Bragg, who says that corporations can't serve jail time, but this is a consequential conviction and serves as a reminder that corporations and executives uh, that defraud tax authorities can't get away with it. William Danslow, New York. The financial penalty imposed by Judge Juan Manuel Mershon was equal to double the amount of taxes that a small group of executives avoided on benefits, including rent-free apartments, luxury cars, and private school tuition. Trump himself was not on trial, and he denied any knowledge of executives evading taxes illegally. A federal judge ruled today that a magazine columnist can proceed with lawsuits alleging she was raped by former President Trump in a department store a quarter century ago, upholding a temporary New York state law that lets adult victims of sexual abuse sue their abusers. 
Judge Lewis A. Kaplan said lawsuits alleging rape and defamation of character and seeking unspecified damages by writer E. Jean Carroll could proceed to trial because Trump's challenges were without merit. An attorney for Trump said there would be an immediate appeal. In the ruling, Judge Kaplan said the Adult Survivors Act was similar to the Child Victims Act, another New York state law that temporarily allows victims of sexual assaults when they were children to sue their abusers years later. Lawyers for the former president had asked the judge to toss out the lawsuit after Trump said the encounter at an upscale Manhattan department store never happened. Trump said Carroll made the claim publicly for the first time in a 2019 book in order to generate book sales. Carroll was a longtime Elle magazine columnist. She initially sued Trump for defamation after he mocked her claims that he sexually assaulted her in, the late, in late 1995 or early 1996 after they had a chance meeting in the department store, and she agreed to help him pick out lingerie for a friend. Trump has repeatedly denied the encounter took place at all calling Carol's allegations a complete con job and saying, she's not my type. Carol sued Trump with the rape claim back in November when the Adult Survivors Act took effect in New York. The troubles keep piling up for serial liar George Santos, the new congressman from New York, whose alleged misuse of campaign funds now has another government accountability group, asking the Federal Election Commission to investigate. Accountable U.S., a progressive watchdog organization, filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission today alleging the New York Republicans' campaign misused funds for personal expenses, accepted excessive contributions, and filed disclosure forms late. At the start of the week, the Campaign Legal Center filed its own FEC complaint, also accusing the Santos campaign of paying personal expenses. Focusing on its suspicious disclosure showing disbursements of $199.99, that's a cent below the threshold for providing receipts. More from reporter Alex Gonzalez. Newly sworn in New York Republican Representative George Santos continues to face escalating calls for his resignation amid scrutiny over lies told during his campaign and says he would do so under special circumstances. 142 people asked for me to resign all their Santos later clarified he would resign if the more than 142,000 people of his New York 3rd Congressional District wanted him to. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries says it's clear to him Santos is not fit to serve in Congress. Well, the spectacle... That is George Santos speaks for itself. He's a complete and total fraud. I'm Alex Gonzalez for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. This is the Evening News on KPFA and Berkeley KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. Russia claims that its forces have captured a fiercely contested salt mining town of Solidar in what would mark a rare victory for the Kremlin after a series of setbacks in its war in Ukraine. Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Igor Konashenkov is a spokesman for the Russia Defense Ministry. His comments translated by Al Jazeera. On the evening of January 12th, the liberation of the city of Solidar was complete, which is important for the continuation of successful offensive operations in the Donetsk region. Moscow has painted the battles for the town and nearby Bakhmut as key to capturing the entire eastern region of the Donbass. It also sees the fight as a way to grind down the best Ukrainian forces and prevent them from launching counterattacks elsewhere. That would cut both ways, however, and Ukraine has said that its fierce defense of the eastern strongholds has helped tie up the Russian forces. Charles de Deletzma reports on the Russian claims. The ministry says Solidaire, the focus of a bloody battle between Russian and Ukrainian forces, was captured on Thursday night. There was no immediate confirmation from Ukrainian authorities to Russia's claim to have seized the town in eastern Ukraine's Donetsk region. 
one of four Ukrainian areas that Moscow has illegally annexed. Solidaire's fall would mark a rare victory for the Kremlin after a series of battlefield setbacks in its invasion of Ukraine. I'm Charles Duladesma. Ukrainian authorities say the fight for Solidar is still underway. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, translated by Al Jazeera. We have analyzed in detail the decisions needed, the reinforcements needed, and the steps to be taken by commanders in the coming days. We have also discussed the situation with the supply of weapons and ammunition to the troops. Meanwhile, a battle is reportedly unfolding in the top echelons of military power inside Moscow. President Vladimir Putin has reshuffled his generals while rival camps are trying to win his favor. Fighting for the Ukrainian town of Solodar in the nearby city of Bakhmut has highlighted a rift between the Russian defense ministry leadership and a millionaire whose private military force, known as the Wagner Group has played an increasingly visible role in the Ukrainian invasion. Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell is an international military analyst. The Wagner Group is led by a guy called Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's actually a convicted um, thief, but he has recruited a whole load of convicts and has been but he's got his own agenda. He's got a political agenda and a business agenda. So he was desperately keen to demonstrate success where the Russian army could not succeed. President Putin's shakeup of the military brass was seen as a bid to show that the defense ministry still has his support as the troubled conflict in Ukraine nears the 11th month mark. With Martin Luther King Junior Day holiday just around the corner. Anti-war demonstrators kicked off a week of actions today in San Francisco in honor of the late civil rights leader's pro-peace message. They rallied in front of the San Francisco Chronicle building with a demonstration against the Ukraine war. Activist group Code Pink said they're demonstrating for more balanced reporting on the conflict. KPFA's Ellie Prickett Morgan was there and filed this report. The Bay Area rain did not stop Code Pink demonstrators from engaging in what they called cheerleading for peace. Kathy Lipscomb with Code Pink said that the U.S. government is diverting essential funds away from needs like health care, student debt, and the climate crisis to help Ukraine fight off Russian forces. She said the Chronicle and other outlets are not doing a good job of covering diplomatic efforts to stop the war. The Chronicle has a a policy of omission, apparently, on how its editorial board feels about the war. There's been nothing to call for a ceasefire or negotiations, diplomacy by the Chronicle, and the war is getting worse. The government's budget passed in December calls for $45 billion in military aid to Ukraine. That's $8 billion more than the Biden administration initially asked for. It's the fourth aid package the U.S. government has sent to Ukraine. The government sent $13.6 billion to Ukraine last March. That's on top of $40 billion sent in May and $12.3 billion sent in September. According to a December poll released by the Chicago Council on Public Affairs, a majority of Americans still support the war. Nearly two-thirds of Americans support supplying Ukraine with arms, and just about as much support supplying Ukraine with economic aid. Democrats in Congress support aiding Ukraine. In October, progressive Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others demanded that President Biden change his policy on Ukraine, but swiftly retracted their request. New House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other Republicans have been reluctant to continue sending money abroad. McCarthy said before Election Day that if they take back the House, Republicans will not write a blank check for Ukraine. Lynn He is also with Code Pink. She says that Americans haven't been given a full picture of the Russia-Ukraine conflict in the media. I think it's it's kind of crazy that um, majority of people, right, really just hear one voice that Russia is the evil, and Russia definitely did the evil thing, um, but U.S. actually played a large part in this part of war, even since probably 2014. 
Many demonstrators said Ukraine is just a proxy war between the United States and Russia. They believe sending money and weapons, like the Patriot Missile Defense System, which the U.S. government recently sent to Ukraine, will not resolve the conflict. Demonstrators said Dr. King understood the costs of war during his lifetime and spoke out against it. In his 1967 speech called On Vietnam, Martin Luther King said the war in Vietnam was diverting funds away from social programs at home. He said, and I quote, There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated, as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continued to draw men and skills and money like some demonic, destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. From Oakland for KPFA, I'm Ellie Prickett Morgan. War! War! Most analysts do not foresee any resolution to the Russian invasion of Ukraine anytime soon. Michael Clare, professor of peace and world security studies at Hampshire College in Massachusetts and the defense correspondent for The Nation magazine, discussed the issue with KPFA Sunday show host Philip Mulderey. My my guess is that both sides, the Ukrainian side and the Russian side, are hoping that they have the capacity for one more big push. Not two, one. Uh, and, uh, and that following that big push, there will be a ceasefire in negotiations. And wherever the armies are at that point, that will be where the new borders of Ukraine will be drawn. So I think the Ukrainians are hoping to make another push in Donetsk area and in the south to try to reclaim as much of the territory that Russian forces occupied after February 24th, before that happens. And I think uh, Putin is going to try another offensive to try to push back. Ukrainian forces uh, to to uh, to extend as much of that Ukrainian territory into Russia as possible. But I think both sides know that uh, at some point they're just going to run out of their capacity to fight anymore, and they're going to have to draw a line somewhere and agree to a ceasefire. So, uh, you know, that'll come somewhere in the next six months. Well, six months is a long time. Uh, the, uh, you know, I follow this every day like most of our listeners do. And uh, when I heard of possibly uh, uh, 400 Russian soldiers being killed uh, in a, uh, a barracks that was cohabitating with an ammo dump, uh, you know, if, if you're a supporter of Ukraine, you can do a thumbs up. Uh, but if you're a supporter of just humanity, the idea of 400 uh, young men, uh, draftees for the most part, being slaughtered, uh, uh, it's 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 not good. I mean, it's just uh, uh, you 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 have to imagine uh, the deaths of of uh, people on both sides, and 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 of course all the civilian deaths uh, in in Ukraine. Uh, there really haven't been civilian deaths in in Russia, uh, but uh, we're talking about people of all ages uh, being slaughtered by these drone attacks coming from Russia uh, inside Ukraine. So. I don't know what I what my question is. It's just a general uh, feeling of uh, absolute uh, uh, horror at uh, the the death and destruction of it all. Well, Philip, that's very eloquent, and I, I you know, my my heart is with you a hundred percent on that. Uh, 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 there, there have been, uh, there have been. Uh, 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 civilian casualties in the areas occupied by Russia since 2014. 
that are claimed to be inside Russia today. So, in a sense, there have been Russian civilian casualties. Uh, but they're, they're, the U.S. military says that there have been 100,000 deaths and injured among the military on both sides. It's an astonishing number, and it's very tragic. I, I agree with you. Uh, this raises an important question, Philip, and I'm not sure how to, how how what the answer is, but. Uh, all these deaths are ultimately attributable to Vladimir V. Putin because he initiated the war. He has approved the strategy of attacking civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. He's responsible for the call-up of those uh, th- those um, new dr- draftees, the new recruits who were sent without training without officer, without properly trained officers or equipment into the front lines where proper mil- with proper military leadership, they wouldn't have been concentrated in that uh, vocational school where they were killed. So he's responsible on multiple levels for all of this. And in an appropriate world, he would uh, have to face uh, some kind of prosecution for war crimes. But, however, you know, we're, to reach a peace agreement, we're going to have to negotiate, people are going to have to negotiate with them, the Ukrainians and, and whoever the intermediaries are, are going to have to negotiate with them. So, uh, and probably he will remain in power. And we will have to deal with Russia when the war is over. So this is a very difficult question. But clearly, in my mind, he's ultimately responsible for these deaths, all of them. Michael Clare teaches peace and world security issues at Hampshire College in Massachusetts. He's author of many books, including 2004's Blood and Oil, the dangers and consequences of America's growing petroleum dependency. Ron Sunny is professor of history and political science at the University of Michigan, specializing in Russia and the former republics of the USSR. Thinking about the war in Ukraine right now has almost a kind of deja vu effect to it. That is, things don't seem to be changing. That is, we've moved into really a kind of war of attrition, uh, a kind of steady Russian attack on Ukrainian infrastructure, pretty effective Ukrainian resistance to the Russians, even some slight advances, steady escalation on the side of the Americans in supplying arms of increasing sophistication to the Ukrainians, which have proved very effective. Some new events like the killing of some 60, 80, maybe more Russian soldiers in a single shot in eastern Ukraine, the strike on a Russian base well within Russia. But otherwise, this seems more of the same, except if you take a kind of larger geopolitical view. And there are some, I'd say, almost glacial shifts that we can observe that may indicate that there might be some kind of change, maybe not in the very near future, but somewhere, let's say, in the spring, maybe March or April. And here's what I'm thinking about. In Russia, there are already signs of a fragility of the Putin regime. Nothing serious, but discontent expressed at the top, sometimes openly, sometimes covertly, among people around the leader oligarchs or right-wing, even more vicious people who want to pursue the war and are discontent with the failures of Putin's efforts. But more importantly than that fragility, I think, is that Putin, Russia, has only two somewhat faithful, I won't even call them allies, but countries that, in fact, support, at least keep quiet about Russia's efforts in Ukraine. One is India and the other is China. This is really interesting. That those two countries, now we're talking about the two largest populated countries in the world, a good large percent of the world population led by relatively authoritarian figure Modi in India and Communist Party leader Xi Jinping in China. And those two countries have not come out strongly against 
Putin's efforts in Ukraine, but have been somewhat cautious in their support, and in the case of Xi Jinping, even openly critical, or let's say subtly critical, of what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Which leads me to believe two things. One, that the countries closest and the leaderships closest to Putin are the one force that might push him, particularly China, to sit down, allow a ceasefire, and begin to make some kind of concession. The second point of that is that India and China, as well as many other countries in what's now called the Global South, are not content and have been critical of the American hegemony or global dominance and pressure that the United States puts on countries like India, like China and others to conform to what the Americans think is the right way to act in the world. So there's a sense in which India, China and some of the global South are actually moving towards the Putin position that what you need now is a new world order of multipolarity rather than unipolarity dominance by the United States. So I think slowly, glacially, as I say, something is shifting. University of Michigan history professor Ron Swinney's many books include Russia's Empires of 2016 and Stalin, Passage to Revolution of 2020. The Brazilian Prosecutor General's Office has asked the Supreme Court to include former President Jair Bolsonaro in its investigation of who incited the January 8th riot in the nation's capital. As the basis for its request, prosecutors in the recently formed work group to fight anti-democratic acts cited a video Bolsonaro posted on social media two days after the insurrection, which said Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, now president, was not elected president, but rather chosen by the Brazilian Supreme Court and Brazil's electoral authority. Bolsonaro deleted the post the following day. In their request, prosecutors argue that although Bolsonaro posted the video after the riot, its content was sufficient to investigate his conduct beforehand. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Merkle. Just after President Joe Biden made the same trip, a bipartisan group of senators this week visited the southern border in El Paso, Texas, as they work to craft an elusive legislative response to the ongoing surge of migrants entering the United States. The group, led by Senator John Cornyn, Republican of Texas, spanned the political spectrum. Cornyn, who has made Increased border security, a top priority, was joined by Republican Senators Tom Tillis, Jerry Moran, and James Lankford, all of whom toured an El Paso migrant facility Monday afternoon alongside newly independent Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, top Biden ally Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, and Democratic Senators Chris Murphy and Mark Kelly of Connecticut and from Arizona. After meeting with city officials, nonprofits, and business owners to discuss the impact that migration in El Paso has on the city and touring a temporary facility for migrants, the group of senators renewed their commitment to trying to find a legislative solution to what members from both parties called a crisis at the border. But many past efforts in recent years to pass major immigration legislation have repeatedly stalled out in Congress where the issue divides the Republican Party. Last Sunday, Biden made his first border visit as president amid sharp Republican criticism. Simon Marks reports. His visit to the U.S. border with Mexico last weekend, the first of his presidency, satisfied neither the Republicans nor many Democrats who have criticized him. Democrats are furious that he's embraced a Trump-era policy that allows border agents to use public health as a screening mechanism to keep migrants out of the country. Republicans accuse the Biden administration of an open-door policy and of paying more attention to Ukraine's border with Russia than to America's border with its neighbors neighbors to the south. Jim Lindsay of the Council on Foreign Relations fears the issue is frozen politically. We haven't been able to fix the broken 
American immigration and asylum system. I don't see this Congress being able to rise up and overcome the political divisions and political posturing. I also think that there was a lot of talk early on in the Biden administration about addressing some of the root causes of migration. It's not at all obvious that you're going to see any effort by the United States government to do that. It costs money. This particular Congress seems to be pretty hostile or likely hostile to wanting to spend money elsewhere. And America, of course, is by no means the only country in which immigration remains a volatile political issue. Simon Marks reporting. If it's woke, trendy, or has anything to do with race and diversity, it appears Governor Ron DeSantis wants no part of it in Florida. That apparently also applies to unions. Tramel Gomes reports. From signing what was dubbed the Stop Woke Act to prohibit teaching certain concepts related to race, the DeSantis administration has now asked state colleges and universities for information about what resources they're putting into activities related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as what some call critical race theory. Matthew Latta, a union chapter president of United Faculty of Florida, says he thinks the governor is following a conservative trend to gain political points, regardless of the outcome or legal challenges. And they're jumping feet first into this without having thought about what the consequences are. I mean, if you remove offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you stop all of those efforts, you will lose federal grants. And we're talking about not millions, but up into the billions statewide. DeSantis received applause from supporters during his inaugural address, critical of what he called trendy ideology last week. On Wednesday, a group of college professors asked a federal judge to block the governor's request for spending data on the diversity programs, which was due today. During the holidays, DeSantis took aim at faculty unions, saying he doesn't want union dues deducted from teachers' paychecks. In a move designed to make it harder for labor unions to get funding, Lada says it's short-sighted. This is not a group of wild-eyed radicals. Most of our members teach in STEM, you know, teach in fields that are supposedly supported by the governor. They appreciate what the union does for them, and we're going to survive. I'd say bring it on and we'll see what happens. There are also plans in the legislature to set a threshold for unions to represent teachers, which would involve at least 50% of teachers approving union membership. Similar bills have failed. Lata believes they can meet that challenge if needed. He says when his union was last certified a decade ago, the vote was 90% in favor, even if not all faculty members chose to join. This is Tramel Gomes for Florida News Connection. The Republican governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, is proposing a measure that would allow the state's parents to send their kids to private schools, including religious ones, and make state money available to pay for it. Mike Moran has the story. Other states have passed similar measures, but not without controversy in what is often seen as a showdown, public versus private education. In her condition of the state message to lawmakers, Reynolds called Iowa's public schools incredible, but said she believes parents have the right to alternatives for their children. She proposes putting money for tuition into an educational savings account. The state will contribute $7,598 to that account, which is the amount of funding the state provides for each child who attends a public school. Reynolds' proposal would be phased in over three years, first providing private school tuition for lower-income families, then expanding to all Iowa K-12 students over three years. But the governor has proposed this idea twice before, and it has failed. Some members of her own party opposed it, in part for siphoning money away from the public school system. Reynolds says she'll work with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle this time around, But Iowa Senate Democratic leader Zach Walls says there are more pressing education issues. The real shortage in our Iowa schools is is the fact that we have thousands of open teaching positions. We know we have a difficult time finding bus drivers, the paraeducators, the gym teachers, the people who actually help teach our children day in and day out. That's the real problem facing Iowa public education today. Wall says Iowa lags behind the national average in education spending by $1,300 per student and calls the voucher plan a scheme that will defund Iowa's public schools. For Iowa News Service, I'm Mark Moran. 
A school superintendent says administrators at the Virginia school where a first grader shot his teacher last week learned the child may have had a weapon in his possession before the shooting but did not find the 9 millimeter handgun that the child brought despite searching his backpack. School System Superintendent George Parker told parents last night in an online meeting that a school official was notified about the weapon before the six-year-old shot the teacher at Rich Neck Elementary in Newport News. A spokesperson for the school system said the student's backpack was searched right after the tip was received. Police said today they were not told about the tip before the shooting occurred. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! right here on KPFA. Open enrollment for health insurance for through Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, ends this Sunday, January 15th, at midnight Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. Pacific Time. Deborah Van Fleet reports. The federal government reports nearly 16 million Americans have signed up since November 1st, with over 3 million new enrollees. In Nebraska, the nonprofit Health Center Association of Nebraska, or HCANS, certified application counselors and navigators have helped over 20,000 Nebraskans enroll so far. Amy Benke with HCAN encourages everyone to apply, even if they aren't sure they'll qualify for a tax credit subsidy to help pay their monthly premiums. Right now, with the way the marketplace plans are going, Almost four out of every five consumers should be able to find plans that are incredibly affordable, even as as little as $10 a month for a plan. The IRS has fixed what's known as the family glitch for 2023, which means many families who might not have qualified for subsidies in the past may qualify this year. People currently enrolled and up to date on their payments do not have to reapply, but anyone who wants to change their insurance plan must do so by the 15th. HCAN has free application assistance online at howtogetcare.org. Nebraskans can choose between four carriers this year, Ambetter, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medica, and Oscar Health. Sarah Marish with Nebraska Appleseed says when people have health insurance, they are more likely to get the care they need. Whether that be preventative care, like going to the doctor to get those regular screenings or treatments, or going to the doctor when they're sick. So we encourage folks to get the coverage they need to stay healthy. And having that in place is a great way to start your new year. New enrollees to the ACA will have their coverage start on February 1st. But Benke stresses the application must be completed by the end of open enrollment on January 15th. So she has some advice for procrastinators. As you get closer to the deadline, we know as with technology, not everything is guaranteed. And so you hate perhaps to have somebody wait till the last minute and have a website crash or freeze or something like that. So we always encourage people to apply sooner rather than later. For Nebraska News Connection, I'm Deborah Van Fleet. In the African country of Malawi, more than 700 people are dead in a cholera outbreak that's infected some 25,000 people and shut down schools indefinitely. KPFA's correspondent Garakai Chonza reports. The disease whose first case was reported in March last year has spread to all the country's districts and provinces, overwhelming health care services. Residents attribute the worst outbreak in Malawi for the past decade to the government's negligence in delivering service to the people. Health activist and health and rights education programs Malawi director Maziko Matemba says authorities should invest in sanitation and primary health care to eradicate this archaic disease. We need to invest in primary health care. We may also need to see what other environmental factors are affecting the upsurge of these conditions. For example, in the cities and towns, people are building houses where there is no proper sanitation, and they're using unsafe water sources. 
These are some of the things the country should address to eradicate cholera, because we've had cholera for many years. Government records show that Malawi has had cholera since the mid-1970s. The President Lazarus Chakwera administration has established a presidential COVID-19 and cholera task force to mobilize resources needed to tame the disease outbreak. Health Minister Kumbise Kandondo Chiponda leads the fundraising committee. She admits a government needs to be more proactive in dealing with this disease. She says they have, however, directed the local authorities to reconnect terminated water supplies to residents failing to service water bills. It is not just about the Ministry of Health. It is not just about the Ministry of Health issues. Of course, we concentrate on issues of case management. And of course, we concentrate on preventative measures. But it goes beyond that. So we are talking to the water boards as well, and they have opened some of the kiosks which were closed because people were still owing money. And we said, we have a crisis. Let's agree on payment terms. In some areas where they did not have any water connections, they have extended the pipes to make sure that all communities have at least a source of good water. A source of uh, good water. The Malawi Red Cross Society has responded to the government's appeal and is providing some cholera services to communities. Priska Chisala is the director of programs and development with the Malawi Red Cross Society. We've been supporting in terms of uh, community awareness. We're supporting the government in terms of community awareness of cholera, but also in terms of strengthening the community-based surveillance and promoting hygiene, sanitation, and access to safe water. We've also been supporting the government in case management, both at community and health care facilities. For example, we've been supporting the government in establishing cholera treatment units through the provision of tents and other materials and other supplies. Prevention and preparedness. The task force says more resources are needed to support them in the fight against this disease outbreak. For KPF, we are in Grahamstown, Eastern Cape, South Africa. This is Garikai Chaunza reporting. The newest Omicron subvariant could be the reason that the state of Arizona starts to see COVID-19 cases on the rise again. Alex Gonzalez has the story. The Arizona Department of Health Services reports over 7,000 new cases in the state last week. The week before that, it was about 5,000. Public health officials are concerned the latest subvariant known as XBB 1.5 could fuel a new surge in cases. Maritza Cota works at a vaccination clinic in Nogales, Arizona. For Cota, it's personal. She lost her mom to COVID in November, who contracted the virus in the hospital. The Hispanic Access Foundation has provided grants to churches like hers that have opened their doors for those at the Arizona-Mexico border who want to be vaccinated. One of the recommendations that we do to get vaccinated is that it's protecting from the COVID-19 and other variants. And the second thing that we're doing is that it helps on their economy and our economy. It's been almost three years since COVID put the world on pause. Cota says she doesn't see that happening again, but supports the CDC's continued encouragement that individuals be vaccinated. And people who have questions about it should check with their health care provider. This Saturday, El Mesías United Methodist Church will operate its mobile clinic from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Cota says since they work in a border town, they've seen a recent increase in the number of Mexican nationals crossing the border to get vaccinations. She says the church mobile clinic tries to make the process as easy as possible, including picking up those who may have difficulty driving. When they get here, uh, people from Mexico or any people or to our nurses, uh, we are informed and we give them any information they ask for. With the recent holiday season, Cota predicts Arizona won't see the full impact of larger gatherings for some weeks to come. The CDC says close to 28 percent of new COVID cases nationwide are linked to the new variant, with the highest concentration in the Northeast. For Arizona News Connection, I'm Alex Gonzalez. Los Angeles police are under fire for three deaths just days into the new year. They've released video of Keenan Anderson's death. He's a cousin of a Black Lives Matter founder, Patrice Cullors. It shows Anderson begging for his life, crying, they're trying to George Floyd me. They're trying to George Floyd me. They're trying to George Stop Floyd me. Stop it. Stop it, I'm going to tase you. Okay, stop it, I'm going to tase you. Stop it, I'm going to tase you. Stop resisting. Please. Stop resisting. Please. Please. 
Anderson died after being tasered for some 30 seconds. His death is one of three at the hands of the Los Angeles Police Department so far this year that have drawn scrutiny. Officials say the three deaths were all of men appearing to be in crisis. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. The videos were devastating, uh, absolutely devastating. It was uh, unfortunate that those officers did not call mental health providers to assist them, but we have to make sure that the resources are there to do that. New Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. Efforts to list several bumblebees as endangered in California are getting consideration by the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, which has opened public input on the petition filed by the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, the Defenders of Wildlife, and the Center for Food Safety. They're requesting the state list the Crotch's bumblebee, the Franklin's bumblebee, the Suckley cuckoo bumblebee and the western bumblebee under the California Endangered Species Act. Some of them are only found in California or in parts of California or just a few western and Pacific states. The Franklin's bumblebee is the smallest range of any bumblebee in North America, occurring only in northern California and southern Oregon. It's not been observed in California since 1998, or in Oregon since the year 2006. Threats to all these bumblebees include habitat loss, climate change, disease, and exposure to pesticides. Comments are due by this Sunday. Animal rights group Direct Action Everywhere said it would hold a memorial in protest today for the latest death of a racing horse at Golden Gate Field in Berkeley the first in the new year. It says last year, 15 horses died, mostly due to extreme demands that racing puts on the animals. The rally was to take place this afternoon outside the Golden Gate Fields in Berkeley. A declassified government report summary released this week shows the U.S. has now collected 510 reports of unidentified flying objects. Last year, the Pentagon opened an office, the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, solely focused on receiving and analyzing all of those reports of unidentified phenomena, many of which have been reported by military pilots. It works with the intelligence agencies to further assess those incidents. Donna Warder reports from Washington. The United States has collected dozens of reports of unidentified flying objects. A declassified report summary released this week says there's been no evidence of extraterrestrials in the 510 reports collected on unidentified flying objects. But the report says those objects still pose a threat because some of those incidents are occurring in restricted or sensitive airspace. Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder. Given the potential uh, hazard that UAPs do present. Notably, there's been no reported collisions of of uh, military aircraft or U.S. aircraft, rather, uh, and UAPs. Last year, the Pentagon opened an office that focuses on receiving and analyzing reports of unidentified phenomena, many of which were reported by military pilots. Donna Water, Washington. Rain and thunderstorms and strong winds are predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the mid-50s. The rain predicted to last off and on, heavy at times, through next Monday. Rain is forecast tomorrow for the central San Joaquin Valley with highs in the mid-50s. That is it for the evening news tonight for this Friday, January 13th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Maracle. Good evening. Do you want to know what's going on around KPFA? On the Deck is the monthly video announcement series hosted by me, Miko Tolliver, where I give you program updates, 
info on our live events calendar, and interviews about show hosts and station history. Visit the front page of our station website at www.kpfa.org and stay current on all things KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. Mm-hmm. 